CEO, Denise Harlow. Thank you, Hyacinth. Hello, everyone. My name is Denise Harlow. I'm the CEO of the National Community Action Partnership, and we're excited to have you on today's webinar where we're going to be talking about how there is, we have an opportunity to engage organizations in an eight-state region in our what we're calling the regional community of practice. So on today's webinar, we want to kind of walk you through with some really key core steps. And as Hyacinth mentioned, we will record this and post it so you can watch it as, um, at your leisure and perhaps share it with your staff. So we want to give you an overview, first of all, of the regional whole family approach community of practice. We want to talk a bit about why we believe this work in this frame is critically important to families across America. We're going to hear from a local agency through a transformation story about how tackling and moving their agency toward a whole family approach has truly moved that agency forward and has positioned it uh, for, for their next transformation story as well. We're going to talk about the detailed or the application process and criteria. I know that's probably what many of you are interested in. What does that process look like? We're going to talk about the expectations. This is definitely a skin in the game kind of cohort that we're pulling together. We'll talk to you about the timeline and the deadlines that we have for you that you need to meet as we go through this application process. And as Hyacinth mentioned, we will have the capacity, we hope, to unmute you so you can ask your questions live if you hit the raise the hand feature or put them into the chat window and we will circle back to those questions as well. Our contact information is also at the end of the webinar and you can email the entire whole family approach team with your detailed questions. And I will say we will have a web meeting, a webinar later this month I want to say on the 24th or so of March, where we will respond to those questions, and everyone from this webinar will certainly be invited to participate so we can share with you the most up-to-date questions, and we'll probably walk through some more of this other general stuff as well at that point in time. So let's go to the next slide. So to start us off, we really want to give you an overview of this whole family approach. Next slide. So this regional whole family approach community of practice will support six community-based organizations, including tribal governments, in achieving hopefully greater results for families and your communities. Again, it's a small cohort. To do this intensive technical assistance takes a big lift. And so we are using and bringing together six organizations, either nonprofits or tribal governments, in this community of practice in these eight states. We have Alaska, Minnesota, Montana, Washington, North Dakota, Wisconsin, South Dakota, and Kentucky. If you're a nonprofit or tribal entity within those eight state, state boundaries, you can apply to be part of our community of practice. Now, if you're for some reason on this webinar and you're not within those eight states, no worries. We're always happy to share and talk about what we see to be a, um, a whole family approach to addressing poverty and increasing family well-being. So please feel free to listen in. And certainly the learnings that come out of this community of practice we hope will be spread far and wide. We're using this small community of practice to do some deep dive technical assistance and then learnings that will be teased out, published, and shared with the broader, um, I would say, country. Um, whether you're a community action agency, a community-based organization of another type, whether you're a funder, foundation, United Way, or perhaps you are, again, a tribal government, we hope to see lessons learned, teased out, and shared with many folks as we go forward. So this community of practice will be a two-year commitment, 24 months, where there will be customized training and support provided to you. Now, certainly that comes with expectations about being part of web-based meetings. We're going to talk about in-person convening. And a lot of that, I know, is time intensive. So it really is a team from an organization where we will be working alongside families. Agencies will create conditions that hopefully invite children to learn and parents to progress and apply their skills, increase education, increase income coming into the household, to, to increase the entirety of family well-being, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. 
So what, does, what will be some of your expectations? And we're going to circle back to more detail later, but we want to make sure we start off today to again to give you an initial frame, and again, we'll circle back to some more of the details as we go forward. So you will be participating in a, in a peer-centered system of learning. Just as we believe families identify their best practices and families are, you know, the center and, and we're person-centered in our approach, we at the Community Action Partnership have been doing this work for a number of years. We have a certain level of expertise, but we come from the perspective that peer-to-peer -peer learning is, is unmatched in many ways, and it's supported with the right coaching, with the right training, with the right subject matter experts, change can happen. There will be monthly in-person live meetings. We use this WebEx technology for our web meetings where people can be on video chat, where we can unmute, where we can have dialogue, where we can ask questions. We'll also be using an online platform where there might be um, homework, there might be assignments, there might be sharing of resources and information through a Moodle platform, which, which we are calling Community Action Academy, but we'll have a blend of virtual, online, I guess those are the same thing in a lot of ways, and then in-person convening. We will have several of those and we'll talk more about those as well. You will have training specifically, you can see here on the slide, I'm sorry, it's above your head, I'm looking up over here, uh, training in TX for coaching from national leaders. We'll be talking about organizational development, racial equity, a trauma-informed approach, and certainly social innovation. This is about agency transformation. This isn't about a new program, a new service. It truly is kind of changing, it is changing the way you're seeing the work that you're providing to families. And we know that programs for children get siloed, programs for adults get siloed, and sometimes we use the two-gen language and we will still use that two-gen language, and we're going to talk about the Aspen Ascend model when it comes to the two-gen approach. But we are using, I think, the, the, even the whole field has kind of moved toward a whole family, because we know it's multi-gen in households. So we definitely want to raise that piece uh, to this work. You'll see here also the concepts of theory of change and logic models. And I know many of us have been doing logic models for 30 years, right? We've been using them in grant applications and program planning, program monitoring and implementation. And this theory of change concept has been bubbling around, right, five, 10 years or so and becoming more formal. And we'll share with you a national whole family approach theory of change. And we see it as a critical building block for local agencies to develop. And you will get help in, de in developing your own theory of change. And again, this checkoff list just again, I think goes through a lot of uh, what I just talked about, access to subject matter experts, you'll have coaching calls with those SMEs as we like to call them, you will have a chance to learn from each other, we will have special tracks at our conferences and events, and again, there will be convenings. Used to be back in the day, a lot of us would get together at a lot of different events and we learned a lot from each other, whether it was informal training sessions or the informal networking things that happened after hours. And we know as we move to a virtual environment, sometimes we lose those, those in-person opportunities. And so they're built into this project and travel will be paid for, for folks to participate in these convenings. But that we see is critical. There'll be three of them, I believe, as we go forward. I will highlight, I know we're sitting here in the midst of um, the beginnings of the coronavirus and we don't know where that will take us. I just wanna make sure folks are on today's webinar are aware that we are aware and it is in the picture of when we think about how we deploy both virtual contact with folks as well as in person. So we will be very conscious of that as we go forward. So next slide, please. And certainly we will come back to this, but this is the application link. Yes, it's a very long URL, um, my apologies. And note that there's an underscore in this application plural, and you'll be getting the slide deck with a live link, so you don't have to type it in yourself. We will definitely send this to you, and it will be done through SurveyMonkey, where you will apply. And in SurveyMonkey now, you can also upload information, and all of that will take care, take place there. The applications are due on April 10th, and that might sing a lot, seem a long way away, but I know many of you have written grants, as have I, and it'll be here like that, right? So now's the time to be thoughtful about your approach. You're gonna hear a lot of terms. You're gonna hear about our theory of change in terms of the broader whole family approach. And I hope that you glean from today's webinar. That's one of the reasons we wanted to record it as well, so you can go back and try to glean as much as you can from it as you put together your application. They are due on the 10th by four o'clock Eastern, 12 o'clock Alaska time. 
uh, because again, Alaska is one of the core um, states that we are working with. So with that, um, we will keep an eye on the chat window. I'm going to turn the ball over here, not the ball literally, but uh, the floor over to Tiffany Marley. Tiffany Marley is our Vice President of Practice Transformation here at the Community Action Partnership. And she has been with us throughout this journey at the National Partnerships Office as we've moved toward a whole, gen or a whole family approach. And it's just a fantastic colleague to work with. So Tiffany, I turn it over to you. You may be muted. And there you are. Thank you very much, Denise. And welcome again to everyone uh, in today's conversation. We really, really hope that you will consider applying for this regional whole family approach community of practice. So why a whole family approach? Our first response to that is, that our children are our future. And the reality is our children don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in families. So let's take a moment to reflect a little bit about the state of children in our country, in our society. So it is about 16% or 12 million of our children who live in poverty in our country. Our youngest children are our poorest children, and 60% of poor children live in small cities, suburbs, and rural towns. And then here's an interesting reality, that two out of three children um, in related families live with an adult who works. So in essence, two out of three children who are basically experiencing poverty uh, are experiencing it with a, an adult, at least one adult who goes to work every day. Let's even take a closer look at the state of poverty or the state of children in our society. According to the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a business case for racial equity, it basically asserts that children of color are a growing majority in our society. It is projected that by the year 2043, they will be the majority. However, children of color are disproportionately affected or impacted by poverty, resulting in the lack of access to opportunities and resources and the support that they need to thrive. So the reality is that growing up in poverty undermines healthy child development and can perpetuate negative impacts for a lifespan. Furthermore, every year that we leave millions of children in poverty, our nation experiences $7 million in loss to productivity and increased health and crime costs. So as we look at our future, and certainly as we look at our future with the, the trends that I've just shared with you as the definition or the indicator, the future social and economic security, not only for children and families that are experiencing poverty, but really the, the, the future of the social economic security for all of us is at stake. So with that in mind, uh, as we think about this whole notion of the whole family approach and other innovations like it, we're given an opportunity to turn our, our attention, to turn our hearts and minds towards a different vision. And this vision implies that we are able to basically achieve results beyond any results that we have achieved before. And this vision is centered in not just meeting families where they are, but meeting families where they dream. And ultimately maximizing people or families' potential to contribute to the civic, social, and economic lives of, of our community. And basically, Creating that support or positioning families to produce a legacy of family well-being 
that passes from one generation to the next. And so as we think about this vision of accelerating social and economic mobility, which we really feel this innovation of the whole family approach allows us to achieve, in doing so, um, it will require accelerating economic and social mobility beyond anything we've done before, but also it will require us to engage more deeply with families. And it will require us to be more data-driven, to be person-centered, to be trauma-informed, giving attention to equity, starting with race, starting with racial equity, and being courageous or bold enough to innovate and ultimately achieving greater impact. So with this in mind, let's take a moment to engage in a deeper understanding of TUGEN as it's called or the whole family approach. And so this is how we define the whole family approach. We say it is building family well-being by working with children and the adults in their lives. And ultimately, the results are that efficiency is improved and outcomes are enhanced for parents, children, families, and guess what, the entire community. And so as we apply the whole family approach lens, it's important that we hold this in mind. One, as human beings, we all have the potential to change and with the appropriate supports, we all have the ability to live up to our fullest potential. And we would offer that the same applies for families. So families have the potential to grow and to change. And so as we think about the whole family approach by providing integrated, high quality, intentional support to parents and children at the same time through a whole family approach, it has the potential to improve both parents and child social and economic well-being, and again, produce a legacy, I'll emphasize a legacy of family well-being that passes from one generation to the next. And guess what? There's science that backs this up. It backs up the notion that given the right conditions, even if a, if a child has experienced one of the um, adverse adverse childhood experiences or if the family lives um, in a community that contains adverse uh, community environments, that ultimately with the right support, with the right intervention, the, the child, especially very early in its age, its brain has the ability to change and to basically interrupt any of those negative um, trends or factors that um, might make them a statistic. The same is the case for parents, which is also very exciting, that parents also have the ability to change and change the way that they handle stress um, and the, the way in which they, they bond with their children and ultimately um, serve as caregivers. So as we look at the next slide, it's the Ascend to Gen Continuum. It, it, it basically provides us with a visual of, 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 of what our aim is as it relates to the approach. And they start at the beginning by inviting us to focus on the middle of this graphic. And who we see at the center or the middle of this graphic is the whole family. And so Denise alluded to the fact that as agencies go through this cohort experience with us, Ultimately, they will change the way in which they do business. And ultimately, a part of that changing or a part of that transformation has to do with placing families at the center, placing the needs of children, their parents, or the adults in their lives, the whole family at the center, being less so predominantly child-focused, less so predominantly adult-focused, and all that trickles in between, but truly keeping the entire family at the center. And ultimately, what our colleagues at Ascend at the Aspen Institute convey to us is that 
a family that forms together. And as, as we think about, like I said, connecting the needs of children, their parents, and the whole family together, as that whole family draws on economic support, education, social capital, and health and well-being, uh, that ultimately the successive generations as well as the current generation enjoy economic security and stability. And so looking more closely, so zooming, zooming in on the theory of change, there are, are several, we say, cogs in the wheels or domains that are mentioned that I just called out. And again, uh, it, 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 is, it, it is believed that, that children who, who have access, families, parents who have access to not only early childhood education, but also those post-secondary employment pathways have the potential to change the course of their future trajectory, and increasing their likelihood to not only transcend uh, poverty and its impact, but to, to make a better life for themselves in an exponential sense. And the same can be said as it relates to um, being able to tap into economic assets. And so the whole family approach um, provides a space in which families are able to tap into resources that help them to maximize the resources that they have, while at the same time they are building skills to be able to earn even more resources to take those resources into the future to turn into wealth and a kind of sustainable stability for the family. And then as we think about this whole notion of health and well-being, it is so critical uh, as it relates to, for example, mental health. Uh, like, I don't know how many of you have heard of the, the, the term toxic, uh, toxic stress. It, it has a, a, a really paralyzing effect in many regards on young children, but also on parents as well. So having those supports uh, from the mental health standpoint, helping uh, families navigate chronic health issues and get those stabilized so that ultimately children can go to school and focus and play and grow and thrive, but also so that parents can consistently go to work and be at work making a meaningful contribution that again puts them on a positive trajectory. And so then that final um, cog in the wheel, social capital, really uh, being the, the family's ability to tap into relationships and networks within their communities that give them a different kind of sustainable resources and ultimately also give them that important opportunity to engage, to give back, to, con to share or express their own leadership um, in the um, civic ecosystem of which they are a part. And so very quickly, as we look at the two-generation or whole family approach characteristics, this is what we want to leave with you. These characteristics center on families, families as the experts, so they, parents uh, know what their problems are and in a lot of regards know what the needed solutions are, so to invite them as co-designers in the, the, the process of moving the family forward is vital. The approach also aims to integrate services, and so giving focus to the alignment of intentional, high-quality, high-intensity intens support systems and funding. It takes all of that, and that within itself is a component of our work that we'll spend a lot of time on because there are lots of layers to that concept. Um, Another characteristic is to remove barriers. And so uh, think about this whole notion of tearing down the walls, so to speak, or creating opportunities for access to, to services, access to opportunities, access, um, access to access. And so that's why we say access, work with families to remove those um, barriers that prevent that access and repeat. Additionally, the approach focuses 
um, or the, 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 the agencies that engage in this approach, they coach. And so think about this, shifting from a case management um, point of view to a coaching point of view, which again places the family in partnership with the agency staff as it relates to understanding what the, the needs of the family are, what goals need to be achieved, and how to get there. Agencies who engage in this approach also partner. It's about internal partnerships, so breaking down those silos that exist within the agency um, so that the agency works in a more um, integrated or collaborative fashion but also breaking down those silos that exist within the community and really identifying other stakeholders or resources or partners who might come together to meet the, the, the needs of the whole family from a, a programmatic point of view, but also from that systems and community level point of view. Then very importantly, an agency who engages in this approach centers their efforts in equity, particularly racial equity. And so again, you heard me earlier in today's presentation talk about the, the growing number of children of color uh, in our society, and that, that growing number of children of color in our society are disproportionately affected by poverty. And so if that is the case, if, if children of color are set to be the majority in our society, but they are also, based on the current trend, I'm set to be impoverished. It says that uh, if we're truly going to interrupt intergenerational poverty and create access to opportunity for everyone, that our practices and our policies have to build opportunities from everyone. And it begins from the very beginning uh, when we engage with families. Then, agencies who engage in this approach measure child, parent, and family outcomes. And so with, with, with that in mind, I'll leave you with this. Why the two-gen or whole family approach? There is a 13% return on investment in high quality early childhood for each year of a child's life. Also, and a college degree doubles a parent's income. And so ultimately, there, there are lots of benefits, and if we had more time, we would share those with you. But the, the, the point is that as, as we think about this approach, uh, it's, it's, it's our opportunity, again, to innovate as organizations and to innovate with families, to move families forward, and again, to cultivate that social and economic mobility and stability that transitions or transcends from generation to generation. And so with that said, I am going to look to the next slide and I'm gonna ask you a question, Denise. Can you speak a little bit to our organization's ability or credibility to do this work at this time? Can you talk about the, 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 the kinds of things that we have done similar to this up to this point. And you may be muted, Denise. And so I can't hear you, so maybe I'll answer my own question. And that is, it has been, is that you? It is, sorry about that. Okay, I can hear you now. <laughs> Go for okay. it. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Um, and I know earlier we kind of just moved right into uh, some of the application now in terms of the whole family approach. The Community Action Partnership, we are the nation's um, membership association for community action agencies and state associations around the country. But our mission is to ensure the issues of, cause, uh, issues of poverty and the causes and conditions of poverty are effectively addressed. And I just want to be clear that this initiative that we're working on through these, this community of practice goes out includes community action but also goes beyond community action to work with other community-based organizations and other tribal governments. So I just want to make sure that we flag that as well. And you'll see that here in the, the, the whole family approach in, term, in terms of the uh, partnerships progression in our technical assistance leadership efforts in the whole family approach. 
on, in rural impact, this was an initiative now probably five or six years ago that was uh, started underneath the uh, Obama administration and followed through and went through a one year of the current administration as well where we worked with 10 uh, rural communities across this country, both community action agency led and other CBO, community based organization led. Um, communities of, of, of who are working toward a two-gen approach. We provided, we, along with the American Academy of Pediatrics, for two, the two technical assistance providers for that cohort. As we've gone over the last five or six years, we've expanded our technical assistance to include uh, what we call learning community groups, where we've worked with uh, community action agencies in, again, groups and cohorts of agencies deploying a range of virtual training as well as in-person cohort training. We've worked with foundations, we've worked with um, HHS, there's some funding streams there as well. And we've had um, LTGs focused on integrated services, which is a piece of the whole family approach. We've had a specific learning, um, learning community group focused on the whole family approach. And we had a bundled services learning community group as well. And you can see how these arrows traverse. Every time we go across the continuum, we learn more and we hear from the members of the cohort about what worked, what didn't work. And we certainly go and learn from others in terms of how to operate um, an effective community of practice from a capacity building perspective. We estimate we've touched probably 100 plus organizations, community action and other nonprofit organizations and tribal governments with our work around the whole family approach and we're excited to bring it to this, our regional whole family approach, uh, community of practice. And you've heard a lot from the partnership. I wanna turn this over here now to our peer expert in the room. Uh, Liz Kowapala is the executive director of Mahabi Atwa in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. And so we know that there's um, various models out there in urban and suburban communities, and we wanted to highlight today, certainly uh, Detroit Lakes is not um, urban or suburban, it's, it's pretty rural in, in Minnesota. Liz has been an advocate for families for decades and has been at the Community Action Agency up in Detroit Lakes now for several years and has really done some fabulous stuff transforming, working with your organization to transform how they have blended and braided services to serve the entire family. Liz and her team have presented at our conferences. We see her as um, a peer subject matter expert. So Liz, we're gonna um, turn this microphone over to you and make sure everyone is unmuted to um, share with us your thoughts on both this initiative and your work in transforming your organization. Excellent, thanks Denise. So for folks on the webinar, you're probably wondering as I was two years ago, like how can you ever find time to put together the application in the first place to join the community of practice? So I wanna just tell you that at the time we started um, as a member of the community of practice two years ago, I was exactly in that space. I was overwhelmed with just trying to figure out how to meet our current obligations. Um, we had a lot of staff turnover, we had some disgruntled staff at the time. Um, we, we, just, we had a lot of retirements. We were just juggling a lot of things. And it seemed like how to take on one more thing just seemed really hard. At the same time, we have a Head Start program. And Head Start, some folks in Head Start thought, don't we already do this? We already serve parents and children. And why this new thing? But um, we, we just thought at the time, we thought if there is something we could be doing better, we want to do that thing. And we listened to low-income families we were working with, and um, they kind of set us on a strategic goal that said, try to find new ways of doing better. So we signed up for the community of practice, and it, it just transformed us <laughs> a lot. Um, so we also, we'd been concerned. We didn't, um, we have enough folks from the federal government and the state government telling us how to do things and often it's not the same thing that our families tell us they would like to see. And so we wondered, how can a community of practice, how can we do what we know needs to be done? And what we found was working with 10 peers across the country and the folks who had been ahead of us two years with the Rural Impact Fellows, we were able to bring questions. They introduced us to topics, to things that we were, you know, somewhat maybe familiar with and somewhat brand new to us you know, concepts like the theory of change or family voice, 
the whole building blocks for the Aspen Ascend Institute, the design plan that the National Partnership has put together. Um, so they introduced us to these tools, but then they also let us like experiment with it ourselves locally and then bring ideas to these monthly webinars or to the na national convenings. And we could talk about how it was working for us or where, where we had some concerns or how our very rural area might be different than other rural areas or might be different than urban areas. And through all of that work, us listening closely to our families, our staff, um, learning some of these tools and getting them um, bouncing ideas back and forth, um, a lot of things happen. One is when we were able to say we were part of a national effort, it allowed us to open doors to folks or go back to folks in our community that we wanted to strengthen partnerships with or maybe relationships that had grown a little stale and boring. So we, we were able to say, hey, we're part of this national um, community of practice and, um, and we're learning these things and we'd really like to work with you better and differently and what about this and what about that and we've got a webinar coming up and we want some information. And um, so it, it revitalized some of our partnerships um, it gave us, as you've heard already, kind of a, a way to shift from a case management model to a coaching model, which we see as shifting from what funders and regulators wanted as the most important uh, to what families want as the most important. It helped us bridge silos between just internal silos. Um, we were a little surprised that, you know, fewer than half of our Head Start families were accessing energy assistance. We kind of assumed that almost everybody had, but when we started looking at actual data, not many were. 12 percent had access our free tax aid program, fewer than 2 percent had access family planning. And so um, by looking more at data and what was really, what did families want, what were families accessing, what were the actual results, um, it just, it's really changed the way we do things. The biggest change we had, I think, was shifting from the general crisis to thrive scale as a tool for measuring where people are at to really um, focusing on what, what we're doing, what partnerships, what strategies are we using to move families from the level they're at to the next level on the crisis to thrive scale. I could talk for hours about that, but um, I'm happy to check in later. So a couple of years in, a few things that have happened for us is we've applied for a couple different over a million dollar grants for this work and um, we've received um, about $1.7 million maybe in funding from several different sources. So we're able to kind of put our dreams together and, and test them and funders are excited about supporting it. Um, we've created new positions for coaches, you know, coaches, coaches on staff, family coaches, coach mentor position that we learned from one of our peer organizations we were able to visit and that, you know, learned about that model. Um, really a shift towards data, not data that funders want, but data that we want as a program to um, move forward. We bridge silos. We have a regular meeting, work group meeting that um, meets every week for just 30 minutes, but it's got um, up and down the org chart and all the way across, um, 12 people putting their heads together to try to figure this out. We've also tapped into many of our staff now as content experts, just looking at what skills and strengths do they have that might benefit our We've made a big push for professional development um, that we've learned from learning from our various peers, trainings that they've brought to their staff, things, things that seem to have worked. But I'd say the biggest shift has really been putting the families in the driver's seat, listening to what families want, what families need, what are the barriers for the families, and working to address that, and then all with a equity lens. And so we've done a lot of work learning about historical trauma and um, it's just diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and having those things centered in our work has been wonderful. And now staff, um, when we survey them, they feel more energized instead of, you know, we always want, worry that if we take on a new thing, like it's going to just be more work, more overwhelm for everybody. But it's changed the way we're doing it in a way that gives our staff more hope, gives our clients more hope. Um, and it's, it's really energizing to be around the work. So 
that's all I've got. Happy to answer questions later or anytime offline. Just to hear you say, Liz, that this kind of approach and the deep dive technical assistance kind of frame just really kind of transformed the work and energize staff and just kind of really change the organization. So thank you so much for sharing a bit about um, Mahabi Atwa's story. And we will find other opportunities for folks in the cohort and even outside the cohort probably will find ways to explore more deeply um, some of the lessons learned um, from Mahabi Atwa. So thank you so much, Liz, for joining us here today. We appreciate it. A couple of questions came in that we just want to kind of pause here before we move into some more of the specifics again around the application process and, and expectations of participants. Um, one of the questions is, can you tell me a bit more about the expertise of those administering the approach, uh, social work background, maybe not specifically social work, but expertise in supporting social service organizations? Um, as a social worker, as a BSW and MSW, I appreciate that question because I do believe that if you're trained in social work, it does give you, I think, a unique grounding in what we all believe what matters to families and, and, how, we, and how we help families move forward. We have a number of folks engaged in this project process who have a long history in working, whether it's in community action agencies or other human service type uh, service delivery. Everyone on the well, most everyone on the team, we have you know some terms of logistics, but the lead professional folks in terms of doing the technical assistance and coaching have been doing this work for a number of years to help support uh, local agencies, nonprofit and public, to help move the needle, to help transform how their organizations operate. We have Dr. Sh uh, Shirley Sher Shervington, Denise Shervington, I you think I know her first name, uh, Denise Shervington on our team as well. She's a medical physician and is really grounded in the trauma-informed approach, and she will be one of our subject matter experts, uh, as well as uh, Jeannie Chaffin on our team, who actually was the director of the Office of Community Services at HHS that oversaw certainly the Community Services Block Grant, LIHEAP, and other programs and services that help low-income families. We have a number of agencies that we included also as subject matter experts here, including uh, Garrett County Community Action, who I think is known nationally as one of the key leaders on the whole family two-gen approach. And Garrett has been very generous with their um, expertise. And uh, Dwayne Yoder has just been fantastic to work with and we're excited to have him on board. And again, our team are well-grounded in human services. Many of them have certificate, certificate, certifications excuse me, in family development or family-centered coaching and approaches down that stream. So hopefully that answers your question. The other question that came in is how does this necessarily con um, connect with or align with the HUD continuum of care case management expectations? And we can certainly try to do a direct cross crosswalk. And Tiffany, I'll see if you want to add anything to this, but my understanding of the HUD continuum of care piece around making sure that families have access to um, housing services and to prevent and end homelessness across this country. As you heard, we, we invest, we're investing heavily in family-centered coaching and having been a case manager um, myself, I understand, right, some of those challenges in terms of sometimes making that shift when you're working with a huge caseload um, of families, for instance, and how do you balance all of those pieces. And again, we can cross off with the HUD continuum of care, but certainly we've been, we, have, we used to have some learning community groups focused on ending family homelessness, and we can certainly crosswalk a lot of those um, learnings that came out of those with this whole family approach. Tiffany, is there anything you'd want to add to my rambling response to that question? Thank you so much, Denise. Um, what I would add is, like, if you think about the, your local continuum of care, um, by, by design, they are collaborative efforts. And so you already um, know who other um, service providers are and are working closely with them to meet the needs of individuals and families. I think, you know, what you have to weigh, and Liz may even have a perspective about this, is um, when families are experiencing homelessness, uh, you know, it's, it's, they're in crisis. You know, it's, it's urgent. It's, it's really about making sure that those basic needs get met. And so um, it may be that the comprehensive aspects of this approach may not necessarily be for those families, but certainly as you think about your organization's overall approach to caring for your families and your customers, aspects of that could be applied to that. And as those families um, get those immediate initial needs met, 
uh, you, you will be able to assess uh, whether those families or other families are ready for, as we said, that more intensive, longer-term engagement through this approach. Great. Thank you, Tiffany. I just want to pause to see if Liz did have anything she'd want to add to that. No pressure. Sure, yeah. Um, so we have homeless programs here, and what we've seen before was, before our transformation, was we would assist people, you know, through the coordinated entry process and things. We'd screen and we'd find the folks. We'd support them. Um, we'd get them up on their feet, and then, you know, a year or two or some crisis would happen, and they'd fall back into crisis. And so we continue to serve the folks who come to us through the coordinated entry process, through the continuum of care. But we look at how we're providing services differently, and then we've reduced caseloads to be able to help people not just move out of crisis, but as they're in supportive housing, um, you know, to really shore them up for the, for the long haul. So, you know, we have crisis intervention is one level, then we move on to benefits, getting people signed up for things. The third level is this deep relationship-based coaching to help them find out what's their long-term plan. The fourth level is shoring up the assets under them, you know, in ways that they want, so they're less likely to fall back into crisis. And then level five is giving back. And so I think that it aligns perfectly, you know, with the with the HUD continuum of care process. Great, thank you, Liz. Appreciate that reality-based response. That's always really good. Good to hear. And that's going to lead us here, I think, into this next phase where we want to do a little bit deeper dive into the application and expectations. We have a significant number of people on today's webinar. We've tried to cross-promote with our friends from um, United Way, National Council of Nonprofits, as well as Community Action with the Head Start Collaboration Offices and others to try to certainly broaden this opportunity beyond Community Action to a large range of community-based organizations, local tribal governments, and others because this is open to everyone. But again, it will be six organizations or so that will be selected for this primary community of practice. We can certainly keep everyone in the loop in terms of learnings, webinar, training opportunities, all that sort of thing. But this is a, an opportunity for those agencies who've kind of started down that path. Um, if hopefully what you heard Tiffany talk about with the whole family approach resonates, you've kind of seen some of that information before, maybe you've put some of the initial components in, you're looking to blend and braid, you're looking to um, bundle services together, you're, you're, you're working toward an integrated approach, those data systems give you a, a headache, but you're doing your best to try to figure out how we manage our data to get there. Um, but for this particular app, for this process, again, we did send out the application link to the SurveyMonkey in the chat window. We will also follow up with it, but it's again up here on the slide. Next slide, again, we just reiterate, it is due on April 10th, so the clock is ticking. Let's go to the next slide here that talks just a little bit about application process and criteria. And again, we want to see an organizational commitment in the application. You'll see some questions about why is now the right time for your organization to go down this path? Kind of what have you done to lead up to this point in time? We are seeking um, commitment both from the executive director and the team. You will be asked for a team of people who will be approaching if this isn't a, like a one-person project, unfortunately, as you heard Liz say. We all don't need another thing on our plate, but the ROI on the other side is significant. And what we've learned over the last five or six years is that team approach matters. It can't just be the executive director, it can't be the family development director, it can't just be the Head Start director, it can't just be the job training director. It needs to be a team of folks who are going to engage in this. We'd like to see evidence of some robust services or partnerships that support early childhood development and services and parent skill building. Now, does this say you have to do all of these programs and services yourself necessarily? No one agency has everything for everybody. But do you have existing working relationships? Um, are you the, an early, head, or early childhood provider and you're bringing in intentionality to bringing in workforce or community college partnerships, um, university aspects to it, another, the one stop? Uh, how is all that working in your community? Again, we want to see some evidence of some robust services on both ends of the early childhood and the parents. The idea, again, is to tear down these silos. 
and evidence of the potential to integrate services again through that whole family approach. So we really do seek organizations who are kind of ready. Um, some demonstrated movements, some demonstrated ability to track and manage data. Um, we know the typical CAP agency at least has probably on average 18 to 20 different data systems. Sometimes if you're a single program organization, you might have fewer um, data systems. And again, this, uh, this opportunity is open to a large range of organizations. But you really want to be able to have some sort of vision of how your organization's policies, procedures, data integration will work together to serve the family. And as Tiffany referenced, this work is grounded in equity, starting with racial equity. And is there, fam is there demonstrated family engagement efforts that truly is grounded in equity at your organization. <coughs> we will, again, we've sent you a link and we will send you another link to uh, the application page. This is available up on our website, which is communityactionpartnership.com. We are a nonprofit C3, um, but we have a .com and have for probably the last 20 years or so. Um, the powers that be want like thousands of dollars to buy the .org, so we're a .com, but we are a nonprofit. And Hyacinth and Amy are off to my side. You can't see them, but they're there. And those will be live hyperlinks when you get a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, for questions, concerns, their emails will be at the end of the presentation as well. Email us. We'd love to have questions. So expectations and commitment, next slide. So you need a team, you gotta have a team. You're gonna have coaches, you're gonna have us to support, um, but again, it's not a one and done in an organization. You need the ability to be on video meetings like this. This is the technology we use. We ask that you have a webcam so we can see you just like you're seeing us. There will be three in-person convenings at a centrally located, hopefully, hub airport, because especially if you're coming from smaller communities, a two-jump airplane is not something that you're looking for. As much as we can be in an airplane hub location, the better off we'll be. There will be monthly coaching engagements with an assigned coach. So again, this is intensive, it's deep dive, it is comprehensive. And you will develop a detailed whole family approach plan that includes, again, a logic model and a theory of change that can be used for a variety of applications, other processes, organization planning, all sorts of different things that you would use. But those would be tangible things that you will develop, I would argue, probably somewhat early um, in the process as well. So what are some of the benefits? You will have dedicated um, core, you will, I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong place. You will have a dedicated space to learn from peers. <coughs> excuse me, and subject matter experts. You'll have specialized technical <laughs> assistance and access to subject matter experts, um, networking opportunities with national funders, resources to build staff and program capacity, enhanced program strategies and improved outcomes, opportunities to contribute to the national conversation on serving whole families. And Liz, our wonderful colleague, she's really already articulated the, the many benefits of such an experience. And so here are the, the, the key dates that we want you all to keep in mind as you look forward. One, we want to remind you that on March the 24th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, and 12 p.m. Alaskan time and every time in between, <laughs> uh, that there will be a second information webinar where we will re-articulate some of the information that we've shared today. Also, inevitably, there may have been questions that have come up in the interim or questions that you want to bring to that conversation. So we welcome you to return to us on the 24th to learn more in preparation for that deadline that is on April 10th. Uh, as Denise has expressed. And then we want to flag for you that this will be a rigorous um, selection process. And so we will be interviewing the finalists uh, for this opportunity between April 20th and 30th. And then the final announcement of the selected sites will occur on June the 1st. And then we want to flag for you that our first virtual, it will be a virtual meeting, uh, will take place on June the 23rd. So as we look forward, 
at our next slide. Uh, we, we've entertained questions. I think we are approaching the top of the hour. Were there any other questions that have surfaced uh, for us to respond to at this time? Yeah, um, interesting one. Um, we have a state that says that they have several agencies who would like to work together perhaps to come in as a collaborative. Would that be an opportunity? Um, I think it's something certainly for us to be thinking about and talking about. We may not be able to like have money to pay for everybody to attend the convening, but that could be could certainly be a cost share um, with the, the collaborative of organizations that kind of want to come in together. Um, we could potentially look at different options. So let us give it some thought, and we can certainly get back to you. But I think that was the last question that came through the chat. I don't see any hands being raised. You can certainly have hands being ra raise your hand, and then we can certainly try to unmute you. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and go through the next couple of slides here real quick while we wait for ad any additional questions. Next slide. You've seen the application link. <clears throat> We've talked about this. Let's go to the next slide. You'll see the whole family approach, the primary team, uh, Tiffany Marley, Jeannie Chaffin, Hyacinth McKinley, and Amy Roberge. I'm around, um, but those will be the folks who will be doing the bulk of the lift on the day-to-day -day kind of stuff. There's the email contact for all those folks. I hope that you will reach out with questions, and as I said, at the next webinar, we will address questions that come in, so you'd have, everyone will have the opportunity to kind of see those responses, so people aren't necessarily getting an unfair advantage necessarily, so when we want to be clear about that. Tiffany, any other last things that you'd want to put out there? Just thank you. And we look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you. And we are here for you, so don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions or needs that you have in this process. Great. Liz, if you're still on, is there any last comment that you'd like to make? There's a question. No, just a lot of encouragement for folks to go ahead and jump in with both feet. You won't regret it. Great. And we do have someone raising their hand, uh, Bonita from Four Wind. I, don't, I can't see the entirety of the name, but you are unmuted on our side if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. Bonita? Looks like it may have come through the Q&A window. So we're going to go ahead and remute that and then will this webinar be available for preview? Yes, we will make sure that everyone on today's webinar gets a copy of the recording and the slide deck. So you can definitely reference back to things if you have questions. And we'll likely also just post the link. Um, to today's webinar on our website as well. So it will be available for public consumption. Great. All right, with that, we will just say thank you to everyone being on the webinar. Feel free to email us. We were going to sign off and we look forward to reviewing your applications in April. So thank you everyone. Have a great week. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.